Hey folks, welcome to the Young Justice video broadcast. And for those of you listening, welcome to the podcast. My name is Zach Rhodes, and I'm here today with author Mark Pendergrass. He's the author of Memory Warp, How the Myth of Repressed Memory Arose and Refuses to Die. Mark, thank you for being with me today. Thanks for having me. I want to first try to figure out how you live so close to me, and I haven't <laughs> heard of your work before. I mean, you've written you, an amazing range of books, and I just want to first, before we get into, obviously we're going to be talking about this field of uh, repressed memory and psychoanalysis right. and Freud. Before we get there, can you tell me a little bit about you, how you got into writing, and how it became such a passion for you? Well, I wrote a book called For God, Country, and Coca-Cola. Uh, which is a history of Coca-Cola, and I grew up in Atlanta, even though I live up here now. So that led me into being interested in, in that, you know, how could this soft drink that is mostly sugar water be the world's most widely distributed product? How could it mm. mean so much to people? And that's what actually first got me into uh, dishing, uh, uh, into uh, criticizing Sigmund Freud, which sort of is a common theme to many of my books. But I've written a lot. I've wrote a, a history of coffee called Uncommon Grounds that I'm probably most well known for. Uh, I wrote a history of mirrors, which I think is fascinating, called Mirror, Mirror. Uh, I wrote a book that is the history of the Epidemic Intelligence Service, which no one's ever heard of, but it's part of the CDC. And mm. that book is called Inside the Outbreaks. So I've written a bunch of books. I've written 14 books, if you count my three little children's books. And I have a great fart joke, children's books. Oh, that's good stuff. Jack and the Bean Soup. I highly recommend it to. I uh, think I saw that, and that's illustrated too, right? It it's is book fully by, by a local uh, uh, illustrator. Maybe you know, we'll have a whole Robert interview Brunel. dedicated yes. to that. Yeah, yeah, we should do that. Before we get into the <laughs> fart jokes, tell me about uh, tell me about your dislike of Sigmund Freud, or your. I guess it's not a dislike because you don't know him personally. But tell me about how you got well, interested. in I feel in like this I know him fairly personally. <laughs> I've read a lot of his uh, letters and his work. Well, what really is upsetting is in memory warp. Uh, you can read how he basically, he would get a theory and then he would kind of force his clients to fit the theory rather than actually listening to his clients. And the worst theory he had was in 1895, which he called his seduction theory. Mm -hmm. He had this idea that uh, if anybody had any problem, particularly females, um, then it all must stem from the fact that they were uh, abused, sexually abused, raped uh, in horrible ways when they were little children, that they completely forgot it. He, he made up this theory of repressed memories and that the only way they could get better was to remember it. But if you go back and look at the way that Freud uh, handled this, he had what he tried to hypnotize them. He wasn't very good at hypnosis. And hypnosis is an absolutely terrible way to get anybody to remember anything. It's a good way to suggest you into something. Right, yes, exactly. But, uh, he wasn't very good at it anyway. So he'd have people lie down and he would apply what he called his pressure method. He would literally push on people's foreheads until they said what he wanted. And then they would say things like, well, I did just think of something just now, but it didn't seem real and it's like it's what you wanted me to say. And he would say, no, no, that was correct. You know, you must do what I tell you. Um, <laughs> So he was horrible. And at the same time, one of his first repressed memory clients was named M Emma Eckstein. Mm -hmm. And he had this, there was this wacko theory that, number one, that masturbation was bad for you and that it caused hysteria. So somebody who masturbated too much, that was terrible. And that it was somehow connected with your nose. So the nerves in your nose were making you masturbate. And to cure this, you could uh, operate on someone's nose. So he had his friend, Wilhelm Fleisch, operate on Emma Eckstein's nose for no reason, and he put a bunch of gauze, he left it in the nose, and it got infected, it abscessed, she almost died, and then Freud blamed her. He, he, she, she almost died because she really had longing oh, for, the, for, the, for, for the therapist. I mean, it's just, it, if nothing else, people should read the section in this book. Uh, there's a section called A Brief History, mm -hmm. which covers th from the great witch craze of the 15 and 1600s and the Salem witch trials up through Freud. And it's just incredible. And it also covers how this whole idea of multiple personalities developed, which is another thing. That, that's the worst. That's sort of like the lunatic fringe of the repressed memory movement. 
and yet uh, it's still in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of, of Mental Disorders, which is crazy, but they've renamed it now to call it Dissociative, Dissociative yeah. Identity yeah. Disorder. But it's iatrogenic. It's something that is produced by therapy. Mm. Um, so at any rate, it, it's a complicated subject, but basically if you cut to the chase of the message of memory warp, there's two of them. One is, if terrible things happen to you, at least from the time you were like four or five, when we remember anything, uh, you remember it. You might not remember every detail, but the worse it was, the more you were likely to remember it, which makes sense evolutionarily if you think about it, because right. we tend to uh, remember the worst things that happen to us so we can avoid them in the future, or the best things so that we can seek them out, and we just don't remember a lot else. So the idea that everything that ever happened to you is somehow or other pristinely in your brain and is just ready to pop out is not true. Even the things, though, that we do remember, every time we remember them, we're regathering from synapses and uh, chemicals all over our brains mm -hmm. to make our best guess. We're reconstructing. We literally are remembering every time we remember something. It's never quite accurate. With influence, it can become amazingly easy to get people to recall quite emotionally terrible things in great detail that never happened. Hmm. I never would have believed it until I did the research for this book. So even if this hasn't affected your family, and the odds that it has affected someone you know are pretty pretty big. I mean, one of the things that I did here, I did the very first study that's ever been done of the general population earlier this year with a psychologist named Lawrence Petihis, who's in Mississippi. And we used something called Mechanical Turk, which is an Amazon program where you can pay people a pittance. We paid them 50 cents to answer a questionnaire. We didn't say we're doing a study of repressed memory. We said we're doing a study of life experiences because mm -hmm. we didn't want it to skew. And basically what it showed was about 5% of the 2,000, over 2,000 people who answered the survey. And we did it, uh, we modeled the, the census so that it, it, it really does cover all ages of adults. Yep. 5% of them had gone to therapy and believed that they had uh, recovered abuse memories. Mm. And if you, you know, if that's accurate, that's over 10 million people. Um, and the height of, the other thing that was interesting about that is I expected that the height of this would be in the 1990s, just going back a minute, or the, the way this whole thing got resuscitated. You know, Freud had this wacko theory in 1895. Right, yeah. He changed his mind within a couple of years. So he took it back. He took it back. That's where he said, oh no, they were just fantasizing. He, he never took responsibility of I forced this on people. Yeah. But he said I took it back, which had a terrible effect also because when people really did come and say I was a victim of incest, uh, many uh, psychiatrists, psychoanalysts, would say, oh no, you're just fantasizing mm. when it was true at any rate. And as we'll talk about, as you illustrated, that, that kind of goes to show why something, however discredited it becomes, kind of seems to linger in popular culture once it's introduced. Yeah, I say that it's kind of like a bloated corpse. It just keeps rising to the surface over and over again. <laughs> once an idea gets into the cultural mainstream, it's just almost impossible to eradicate it, and people believe in it. It's like uh, an urban uh, legend that just won't go away. So what happened was in the late 1980s, a book came out called The Courage to Heal by Ellen Bass and Laura Davis. And that popularized what was already going on in, in some areas, particularly in Boston and Berkeley. Um, but it, it became the Bible of the repressed memory movement. It basically said, if you think you might have been abused, you were. And all you have to do is remember it. So it became a huge epidemic. Uh, in by the early 90s. And then the false memory syndrome came along, which was saying, hey, hold on a second, something's wrong here. And many, many uh, parents and uncles and grandparents and coaches and 
former babysitters who were yeah. being accused of this 20, 30, 40 years later were saying, I didn't do this, what's going on? We talk about, well, go ahead, finish, but I will see if you can talk about some of the specific stories that you mentioned. There were a lot of stories. I mean, there's a, I think the most horrifying thing in here is I quoted a letter written in May of 1987. Two, two different letters, right? Yeah. This, this is a letter before Re The Courage to Heal came out. <laughs> Dear Dad, just a note to thank you so much for taking such good care of me and my friend during our much too short stay. My friend is impressed and a bit envious of the loving relationship and open lines of communication which you and I share. I love you and I'm glad you're my dad, love, D. Okay. Two years, two and a half years later, November 1989, no, dear dad, I am writing this letter for two reasons, to attain closure for myself regarding my relationship with you and in the hope that you will seek help before you hurt anyone else the way you hurt me. And she goes on to say that she had repressed all these memories, but they've now come back to her. So I heard these stories over and over again. Now, cut to the present. I thought, yeah, because I would hear from people you know, because I wrote this book, Victims of Memory, like 20 years ago, over 20 years ago. So I'd hear from people periodically saying, well, you know, I've lost my daughter. She, she's suddenly cut off all contact, and she's implying that I did something horrible to her, and I didn't. I don't know what's going on. They would contact you? They would contact me often because they would have read my book, and I'm easy to find. You know, markpendergrass.com, that's my website. And if you write to me from that website, it goes directly to me. Mm. And I will answer and try to help anyone. But I thought, you know, it's just, a, it's just a few cases. It's not a big thing. But what happened, apparently, was that with the priest cases in the early part of the century, yeah. um, most of them, I think, were true. But there were a minority that were not true, that were based on uh, recovered memories. You know, whenever anybody asks, tells me that they were abused as a child, the very first thing I ask is, did you always, re re that's terrible, I'm sorry to hear that, but did you always remember this? Yes. And if they say, yes, I did, then I, I tend to believe them, uh, unless there's some other motivating factor like money or whatever else that might come into play. But, but if they say, no, I've just recalled it, I say, well, you know, how did you recall it, uh, and uh, et cetera. So, in general, uh, if, if people had something horrible happen to them, particularly if it was for a long period of time, they remember it. Um, I did find some cases, I should make this clear, I did find cases I, that were uh, confirmed and that I believed that people had forgotten about a limited kind of abuse. Usually it was like fondling or exposure. Mm -hmm. um, and what I concluded was uh, these, none of them were prolonged horrible abuse. And at the time that they occurred, they might have been confusing, but they weren't terribly traumatic. Right. They, and would, they would be uh, either illegal or frowned upon behaviors, but not necessarily something that would have traumatized the individual. That's right. Yeah. And so they forgot it. We forget lots of things. And then when you're reminded of something, it, you say, oh, my goodness, I hadn't thought about that. Mm -hmm. When they remember it, that could be traumatic because then they've already been taught this is terrible and I must have been horribly traumatized yes. as a child. So it's not totally black and white, but it's very close to, to, to being that. And so... There, there have also been, the reason I did this study with Lawrence Petitus mm -hmm. in, in Mississippi is he had done a very interesting study of beliefs about repressed memories. It was published in 2014. It was horrifying. That was one of the reasons I started to, to work on this book. It showed that something like 80% of the general public believes in repressed memories believes, oh, oh yes, I, I know, of course that's true. I must, I've, I've seen it in an Alfred Hitchcock movie or uh, any number of movies. It makes a great plot for novels or movies or television shows or whatever else. Mm. Um, and something like 65% of psychotherapists still believe in it. So you were saying earlier before we were on the show that they don't teach Freud a whole lot anymore. Not typically, no, right. But Freud... Freudian thought is like mother's milk 
to yeah. clinical psychologists, to people who are getting masters in social work, they don't teach what I'm saying in memory warp. They don't talk about it. In fact, the psychological establishment has very carefully tried to shove this under the rug. They don't want to talk about it. Um, and they treat it like, oh, well, those were a few fringe therapists who did this. It wasn't a few fringe therapists. It was 25% of every psychotherapist in 1993 specialized. This is what they did in getting people to recall this. And most of them still believe it. So if you believe something, you will convey it to somebody. Picture it. Somebody's going to therapy. They're, they're in a vulnerable situation right. or they wouldn't be coming to therapy. And right. here is this authority who says, you know, in my experience, people with your symptoms, you're depressed, you have postpartum depression, or you have an eating disorder, maybe that was caused by sexual abuse. But we're not going to pry for it because we, I'm not going to hypnotize you. It might come back. Well, you say, well, I, that's ridiculous. No, that's uh, not true. A lot of incentive to chase that. That's not true. But if it were true, how, how would I know? Um, well, you might dream about it. Um, and then you will dream about it because you'll become obsessed with it and what we dream about is what we're worried about in life. Or they'll tell you you might have a body memory come back uh, that your the body remembers what the mind forgets, which is total pseudoscientific claptrap. Um, but yeah. they'll tell you to pay attention to some bodily pain and that that's reminding you. Or they'll tell you that you might have a panic attack, which you might because you're so yeah. worried about that. Yeah and that that's a flashback to some sort of abuse. And then so many times it would be, oh, I know I was abused, but I can't remember who, and then they'll try to figure it out. Um, it's, I, this is not just a scientific controversy. This has ruined people's lives. It's destroyed families. The people who have come to believe in these memories quite often uh, try to commit suicide. Some of them have succeeded. Uh, they lose their marriages, they lose their careers. Um, it's just heartbreaking and it's unnecessary. And so that's why I thought it was very, very important that I uh, do a new version of, of this book. And so I, Memory Warp is $20. Uh, this is the book, folks. And uh, the, other, the other thing I found out, by the way, and uh, I wanted to mention that I have another book. <laughs> this I is, thought you'd never bring it up. I was going to ask. This is kind of a, a companion piece called The Most Hated Man in America, Jerry Sandusky and the Rush to Judgment. This is an amazing story. It turns out, you know, I thought, of course he's guilty. There's that guy who saw this, you know, he was the former Penn State coach. Yep. And he started a, a program to help troubled youth called The Second Mile. And it's been presented that he used that as like a candy store to molest children. To cut to the chase, because we don't have a whole lot of time, I'm pretty sure he's innocent. I visited him in, in prison a couple of times. I've gotten to know his entire family quite well, many of his friends. And I've interviewed everybody I could find who will talk to me from the uh, mm. other side also. Um, but what happened was somebody contacted me out of the blue in 2013 and said, you know, I've read your book about repressed memories. Did you know that there were repressed memories involved in the Sandusky case? Right. I said, really? Well, I'll look at anything, but what about that guy who saw him in the shower? And she said, well, he didn't see anything. Y you need to look at this. And she was smart. Her name is Glenna Kirker, uh, grandmother in, in uh, Oregon, and she just is smart. She read the transcripts of the trial. Anyway, this guy, Mike McQuarrie, who supposedly saw him abusing a child in the shower, he didn't see anything. He heard slapping sounds, mm -hmm. which he interpreted as sexual. And that's all he did. And then 10 years later, the police come to him and say, we know that Sandusky is this evil molester. And it doesn't take repressed memory therapy to do this. People change their memories, depending on their current attitude. And so he pictured what might have gone along with those sounds. And that's how he came up with this scenario. Now, people are going to wonder. I mean, the case is closed in terms of the general public. So people are going to wonder. The case should not be closed. Well, that's, but, that, but that's what I mean. Just like, the, just like you know, 80% of people, or whatever the number was, who you know, practice you know, psychoanalysis and repress memory, well, the, you know, a who huge... Who believe in it, yeah. Right, who believe in it, right. 
a majority of people in America, if they're, you know, in touch with popular culture and the news, will say, well, that's a case that's right. closed. And uh, good riddance, don't come back. That's so uh, do, do you think that, wh how do you answer people, because you must have thought about this, uh, how will you answer someone who says, aren't you just making a jump by saying, because repressed memories were involved, that he's not guilty? RTB, read the book. That's mm. my mantra for this book. Read the whole book, then I'll be more than happy to talk to you about it, and I'll be more than happy to, to hear what you think. But until you, it's a complicated subject. It's about a 400-page book. Um, it's not just repressed memories. It's not just Mike McQuarrie changing his, his memory. Yeah. Uh, it's money. Uh, they threw over 100,000, I'm sorry, over 100 million dollars at these rather troubled young men who, without vetting the claims, at all, from what mm -hmm. I can figure out. And most of them, we don't know who they are. So what I did was I analyzed the uh, original eight people who testified at trial. And it was really only six of them who came forward before all hell broke loose and this became like the blitzkrieg uh, media story uh, of the century. Um, and they clearly did involve repressed memory therapy and terrible police interviewing methods. The police went around and found all these second mile kids, about 600 of them, and they got uh, less than about 1% of them to say something. Yeah. And that was after going after them and after them and after them. Almost all of them said originally, no, he didn't do anything to me, uh, or they wouldn't talk about anything. Now, yes, especially with boys, it's embarrassing to be sexually abused, and I think many people don't come forward. But nobody said anything whatsoever uh, about Sandusky being this horrible abuser until uh, this kid went to therapy with Mike Gillum. And Mike Gillum didn't need him to say anything. He guessed what had happened to him. And he only had him say yes or no. He didn't mm. actually have to say anything. Uh, and that's a quintessential feature of the repressed memory gone wrong, the movement gone wrong, isn't it? It's quintessentially bad uh, therapy technique and bad interviewing technique. Mm -hmm. And the police would say, well, you didn't say anything to us now, but maybe you'll remember something at 3 in the morning and you can call us. So the police basically told them that they might have repressed memories. It's an amazing story. And I, I estimated that this has cost about a billion dollars. It killed the Second Mile program entirely, which is a wonderful program to help troubled kids. And it's, you know, put other people in, in prison. Uh, it's had all these spin-off effects all over the place. It's, it's an example of a moral panic. You don't have to give anything away, but what is, what is their best case, really? I mean, for people who have either forgotten it by now, what is the best case for the prosecutors for Sandusky that you would come across with? And you don't have to tell me how you ended up arguing with it, but the, the piece that you would say, oh, now there's something that, that makes me wonder. Or, there know. was only one kid named Michael Kajak who, who uh, said that Sandusky did something to him the first time the police interviewed him. Mm. And I wanted desperately to talk to him, but he wouldn't talk to me. Um, but if you look at it, you know, he had two friends who were already going into therapy and who were talking to him about the case. The case had already hit the newspapers. Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't believe his case, I don't believe any of the cases. Some of them were just crazy. One of them was uh, like, quote, victim number two was a guy named Alan Myers. Mm. who was at the time almost 14, and he was the kid in the McQuarrie shower. And he came forward and said, I was there, Jerry Sandusky never abused me, the only people who abused me were the police who kept after me and trying to get me to say something I wouldn't say. Several weeks later, he gets lawyered up, and he has now you know, earned several million dollars by being an accuser. But he never has said exactly what it is that he's changed his mind to. So. I mean, I'm telling you, the entire case smells highly of fish, and you should read the book. I will. And speaking of moral panic, the, the visceral response from this, I already know. It was mine at first, but luckily I'm thoughtful, is that, um, you know, yes, these kids are coming forward. Yes, these are memories that you're saying um, are probably not true, but you're not saying they don't think they're true. To harken back to what we were saying before, these people, if 
their memories are not true the way that they're describing them. They think that they are. Is that your case? Yeah, there's a big distinction between people who are not telling the truth and people who are consciously lying. Right. And in most of the cases in Memory Warp, and many of the cases in the Sandusky book, people have genu genuinely come to believe it. The only uh, accuser that I was able to interview at some length was uh, Dustin Struble, and he told me, oh yes, this was all repressed memory. I said, what would you have told me about Sandusky in 2010 before you had your memories come back? I would have mm -hmm. said he was a great friend and a mentor and had done so much for me. I didn't have any of these abused memories. So it was extremely clear that he totally believes this now, but it's not true. Others, you know, greed had a lot to do with this. Money had a lot to do with this case. And so I think some of them are consciously, well, or it's convenient for them to believe this because they got so much money from it. Yeah, it wouldn't be tough um, to believe that some of this is unprincipled uh, action. Particularly after the trial and after the conviction, uh, people came out of the woodwork. So uh, I think some of them, you know, and some of them were in prison who maybe they had gone to some football camp with uh, Sandusky at some point. Um, and they thought, oh, well, he must have done something to me, too. So, again, you, you basically have to, to, to read the book to get the whole idea. But, I'm, you know, they're really, they're companion books. Memory warp is absolutely necessary to understand how the brain works, how memory actually works, yeah. how people can come to believe things that aren't true, why they would come to accuse people they love. Yeah. Their parents, their grandparents. People like to think they have a pretty good ownership of their memories, but just we none of us do, right? Well, you know, if you have brothers or sisters, you all know that stories that you tell that <laughs> happened to you yeah. might have actually... Your, Sound your, different on Thanksgiving. Your, your, <laughs> yeah, your brother yeah. says, no, that happened to me. Yeah. You've taken my memory. Yeah. Um, so we misattribute things fairly often. Uh, it, it, it's alarming. Because who are we? I, I said in here, let me, this is one of my favorite little bits. Let me see if I can find it and read it to you. And then, uh, uh, where is it? I talked about memory. Um, without our memories, how would we define ourselves? Memories are who we are. Arguably, it is our capacity to remember, reflect, and verbalize on the past that separates us from other animals. Mm. Because we can recall the past and project it into the future, we understand cause and effect. We can create hypotheses. Memory allows us to be scientists, poets, storytellers, and creators, but it also is imperfect and it allows us to go off in terrible directions. The other thing I got from this book is be careful what you are a crusader for. Be careful what you, you know, because, and the therapists who, who did this were not bad people in general. Uh, they truly believed this. They were ignorant about how memory worked. They were ignorant about how suggestibility worked. Um, but the road to hell is paved with the best intentions and often the most passionate intentions. It's a religious calling almost. And so I have a whole chapter in here about religion and, and survivorship as religion. So it, it's a complex but I think fascinating book. And you were you were reading it and you were saying that you liked my writing style, which God bless you. <laughs> I, I do. Yeah, I think you make it easy to read. I happen to be a, a nut that just it enjoys more looking at statistics and studies. So it was very, it was, it's a great read, I think, people who enjoy good prose, a good narrative to go along with just very deep research are going to enjoy it a lot. Yeah. I want to ask one more thing. We have a few minutes left. You were talking about how in the 90s, what was it, 95, when the first book, and what was it called, uh, Victims of Memory, Victims of Memory hmm? was written, you were talking about how there's, there was a huge wave of this repressed memory notion, and it seemed to die down somewhat. However, now, of course, uh, apropos your Sandusky book, and um, I won't get into what we were talking about before, but I know a man named Gabor Mate, who um, I've been speaking against, who uses, I think, this repressed memory notion. Is this sort of like a pendulum that swings one way or another? Or do you think it's something that happened and there was a craze and it's still, like you were talking about? Um, it was going on at, at, uh, under the radar all the time. No, it's not just a matter. The pendulum in our society clearly does swing back and forth for everything. Yeah. Uh, 
But no, this whole repressed memory notion never went away. It continued to happen. You know, in this survey that I told you of, yes. we asked people, what year did you get your memories back? And they were right along. It never stopped. So it was alarming. The other thing you asked me was whether therapists have taken this back. Oh, right, yeah. I did. At the end of the book, I called for them to please try to undo the harm they'd done once they actually figure out, you know, yeah. what, what went how, on. How, how does this happen? As far as I know, I know of two therapists in the entire United States who've had the courage to come forward and say I was wrong. Yeah. Paul Simpson, who wrote a book about it called Second Thoughts, Linda Ross, who's a Texas uh, psychologist who went on uh, This American Life and talked about it openly, which, by the way, I told This American Life to talk to her. Um, so it's hard to say that you're wrong. I've got another book to recommend to you. It's called Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me. Hopefully my listeners will have heard my talk with Carol Tavers that I did, and we did talk about that you book. You talked to Carol. Oh, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, I had her on the show. She's a yeah. hero of mine. That's it's a wonderful. great book because it tells you people won't say they're wrong. Right, I mean, they're exactly. In, they're so invested in, especially if they've caused harm, like the, you said, uh, district attorneys who, who prosecuted uh, people who were proven innocent by mm -hmm. uh, uh, DNA evidence, they still won't yeah. admit that, that they were innocent. And in fact, they double down often on their original theory, don't they? Yes, they do. So it's called cognitive dissonance, is this uh, theory that Carol writes about, and I wrote about it in, in uh, Memory Warp as well. The idea that you can't keep two contrary ideas in your head, so you have to plop down on one side or the other, and once you've plopped, it's, it takes an act, uh, you know, uh, a huge amount of courage to change your mind back again. So once people glom on to a particular point of view, and what's great about Carol's book is she does have a chapter on repressed memories, but yeah. she also talks about marital relations, about <laughs> politics. Um, uh, so it, I think it's a book everyone in the world should read. Is, is a, it's Carol Tavris and Elliot Aronson. Aronson. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mark Pendergrass, thank you very much. I, I wish I had a little more time to talk to you. Maybe we can do interviews in the future. Sure. And hope we keep in contact. I encourage everybody, again, to read Memory Warp, The Myth of Repressed Memory. Oh, sorry. Ready. <laughs> Memory Warp, How the Myth of Repressed Memory and Rose and Refuses to Die. Uh, again, this is Mark Pendergrass, and he has a new book out stemming logically from this book about Jerry Sandusky. The, the most name. hated man in America, Jerry Sandusky and the Rush to Judgment. I knew that. All right, thanks again. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. I'll see you guys next time. I will be interviewing Jonathan Pfaff from New York City. Uh, he wrote a book called Locked In. Uh, tune in next time.